Hi, I'm Dean, and this is the Coffee with Nick podcast, where my son Nick and I sit down and talk about the stuff that we would normally talk about, only we record it. In this edition of the podcast, we talk about podcasting software, fires in Brazil and their reflections in social media, tribalism and science, and Tool, one of Nick's favorite groups. The editing at the beginning and at the end is a little rough, but we're still getting the hang of this podcasting thing. I hope you enjoy it. Zencaster, uh, uh, last time I recorded with Kyle, it just, it straight up just added five seconds of random dead space in the middle of our conversation. It was brilliant because... Just on one of the recordings? Yep, just on one of the recordings made editing absolute just trash. It was terrible. Well, let's try it again. I got Audacity running over here and um, if it doesn't work, we can try something else next time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it should work. I don't I, I don't know why it, I don't know why that happened. And then for some reason, Kyle's audio was really bad. It sounds really good like when you're listening to it through Zencaster and then once you get it off, it's really bad so i i don't i don't get what's going on so did you you didn't do a double recording then you just use zencaster no i did a double recording it it recorded his audio even worse on audacity this time around so zencaster was bad audacity did a worse job so for some reason with audacity it had like this this echoing continuous echoing and in zencaster didn't have that but zencaster dropped like a bunch of sounds it, it was just like it was overall just a, a bad experience which was weird because the the first time that we did both of them uh it was it, it turned out perfectly fine the audacity recording was was crystal clear sounded really good so i don't know i don't know what the deal is anything remote is uh is gonna be an issue yeah i don't know why that would be though yeah i don't either you wouldn't think it would take that much uh a, a massive bandwidth to be able to send just some audio and you're not even, I mean, you're recording locally. So, um, you know, each of you is recording locally. So the quality that way you'd think would be excellent. All you yeah. really need to have in sync is, you know, the the audio where I, the monitor so that I can hear what you're saying and you can hear what I'm saying. And if yeah. that's a little off, who cares? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What, I don't know what happened with that. Just keep plugging away. Keep trying to to work on it. Actually, our next homespun yak episode comes out in forty five minutes. All right, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Speaking of audio, that audio on your. Um... YouTube live with Bobby Oof. was it? <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> yeah, the, the live audio was um, really poor. So you weren't using the microphones for that? You were using some other mic in the room? I was using no microphones whatsoever for that audio, which was, <clears throat> I, I knew it was going to be an issue, but I didn't realize it was going to be that much of an issue. Um, it was, yeah, it was terrible. Um, definitely something I'll have to fix in the future. But granted, you're using the microphone that I typically use to plug into my my computer for that. But I'm sure I can find uh, find some other other microphones. I have I have a series of different microphones. So I should be able to find something to to fix it next time. What about that one that Stuart gave you? Wasn't that a omnidirectional one? Yeah. Uh, but that's that's not mine. Oh wait, 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 wait. Which which microphone are you talking about? The one that I'm recording with right now, the Audio Technica. I don't know. It's a ball, I think. 
Oh yeah, that is in Wake Forest. Oh. Yeah. So I can't use that. <laughs> well, I'm excited to see how this one works with my new m mic boom. It uh it sounds pretty good. It sounds pretty good. It's just a uh, very faint buzzing every once in a while that I hear, but it's not, not distracting at all, so it's quite clear. I have to take some of the springs off of it because it doesn't want to stay down where I want it to be. Yeah. Okay, now I'm set. Now you're set. So for the homespun yak, you also need a technical advisor keep you guys on track technically no i completely disagree i don't <laughs> want a technical advisor i just want to make mistakes <laughs> like for once in my life i just i want to make mistakes and not care <laughs> oh so that's what it's all about <laughs> uh, i mean no no joke like that i talked to kyle about that i was like listen i the physiotic podcast i have to be on ball it, when we talk about things, obviously, like between the both of us, we can correct each other on different things. But for the Jovio, and then uh, for for other stuff that I plan on doing, like I have to be on ball too. So I don't know. I just want to. I just want to be able to talk and make mistakes. And like if people correct me, that's perfectly fine. Like that's that would actually be that would actually be fun, you know, to have to have people correct me and uh, or correct us. And not have to sit there and have your brain constantly interject with, is that true? Is that true? Is that true? You know, it's just, uh, it becomes a little overwhelming. You, you just want to back away from the intellectual side for for a second. Uh-huh. Hence the name Homespun Yak. Yeah. Just a conversation. That's all it is. And... You're going to make mistakes in conversation, no doubt about that. I think the uh, you talked about the um, fires in the Amazon. I think that's an yeah. interesting topic that a lot of people are not really equipped to uh, analyze. And I haven't actually seen anybody talk about, you know, the realities of carbon capture in the Amazon and um, what this actually is going to mean for the overall carbon balance on the earth and you know about the fires how is this really such a bad year for fires in the Amazon because uh, there are fires every every year in, in the Amazon right yeah I uh, I think that's actually a really good point because a lot of a lot of times when you read headlines and whatnot they never they kind of say absolute statements but they don't actually make that relative to anything so you know i mean maybe this particular fire just caught traction because of i don't know a particular news outlet or an influential journalist decided to cover it and now it's become this huge thing but maybe it's something that happens every year and people just don't know about it um, or we're just making a big deal out of it this time right because uh, people are tired about talk tired of talking about plastic straws so it's <laughs> something else to talk about yeah but from what I've read it I mean it is a bigger fire season this year than usual i don't know how much bigger if it's three times as big or 30 percent bigger but um it's not like we haven't had these fires before i'm not trying to minimize it at all i mean i know that um the brazilian powers that be are not um doing everything they can to minimize this um burning of the rainforest right uh didn't they reject like x amount of millions of dollars 
Yeah, like twenty twenty three million dollars or something like that. Everybody said, "Hey, here's some money. <laughs> Why don't you put those fires out?" <laughs> and they said, "Nah, we like the fires." <laughs> Do you know why? Did I? I didn't. I didn't look into it. I just glossed over the article, but my impression was that it was. Um, don't mess with our internal affairs. We'll take care of our country. You just mind your own business. Yeah, that's an interesting discussion because they might have a point, but on the other hand, you know, well, trees kind of influence the, 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 the oxygen kind of goes beyond your borders. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Yeah, it's is the Amazon apparently is a big contributor to the oxygen content and carbon ca capture in the, in right. the world. Yeah. <clears throat> and really what they're it seems like what they're doing with that land is really short sighted, you know, dumb growing soybeans and grazing cattle which is probably not the best use of the land though I mean that it's their land and if they feel like they've got to squeeze some economic benefit out of it you can understand that too yeah yeah it's a complicated situation but as with anything it feels like everybody gets into an uproar and then maybe something gets done maybe something doesn't get done no one really cares right like you're saying like everybody is raising awareness and nobody's actually doing anything yeah yeah for sure <laughs> uh, I mean but she also just there there's always an understanding with that kind of stuff too though because we only have a certain amount of attention we can give to any particular subject like people people want to care about you know like gay rights people want to care about women's rights people want to talk about the rainforest people want to talk about the mass shootings people want to talk about you know it's just like the list is just so long <laughs> and yeah. you're you're essentially competing for people's attention on like hey this is the thing you should be worried about and like granted we aren't stuck to one thing like hey this is the only thing i can care about but there's it's just unrealistic to think hey i'm going to be an activist for like a hundred and that's 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 a, a minuscule portion of the number of things that we we actually should care about but like let's just say a hundred different subjects like being like you would have to be a lifelong activist just constantly working and you'd have to that would have to be like your career because it's it's such a time commitment and it's it's absolutely admirable like in whatever direction you end up going but people never really consider the fact that you, you you just don't have the mental in energy a, 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 a single human being doesn't have the mental energy to to become educated to then run into activism to to actually start promoting that activism like going through all these different scenarios it's just it's too much like it's too much information Right, and it's made difficult by all the people who are throwing their arms up in the air and screaming and running around in circles and saying this is the end of the world and um, everybody pay attention to my problem because it's really important, but they don't um, add any real information to the um, discussion on that problem. Like how many pictures of the burning rainforest have you seen in the news and how many times have you seen it explained well there are fires every year and this year is a little worse or a lot worse or whatever any real information on how grave the situation is everybody's right. trying to amp it up to 11 for their i don't know to 
to draw in readers, I guess, to, to compete a little bit for that, atten that limited amount of ten attention that everybody can devote to these issues. Yeah, yeah, and then you just have a bunch of people that sh are sharing a bunch of articles or memes. It sometimes devolved to memes, just like little picture graphs. Right. Right. The overhead view of the Am Amazon burning. Right. Yeah, I mean, but the, <laughs> which is a bit comical in its own right, just to think that uh, if if you're trying to reach people about the Amazon, and you have it, the communication style devolves to a meme or a picture graph, most likely that is not the individual that's probably going to make any difference whatsoever. They're going to. I mean, if they can't even invest enough time to open an article and read it, there's there's just no chance that 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 person is going to be like, you know what, I do need to drop everything I'm doing <laughs> and uh, educate myself on this topic, then start an activism campaign, contribute money, maybe even go to Brazil. Like, you know, it's just that's just not going to happen from from sharing a, a single uh, little little picture. Right, so they're just adding to the noise surrounding the issue. Yeah. And making it harder for somebody who really does want to know what the, how serious it is and what can be done to find that information. Yeah, yeah, and that's true of a lot of things. How, uh, how are you going to find how are you going to find the information how are you going to develop an opinion and it's just man oh man it's just time time right. and energy it's just it's it's so abundant but you know it gets squelched by just the sheer volume of of subjects that are out there for us to consume Right, and um, it's difficult to find reliable sources. I mean, that's actually what Physionic is all about, right? I mean, how many people are there out there giving really bad um, uh, exercise and nutrition and physiology and in general information compared to the few who are giving solid, providing solid information? Yeah, there are very few, uh, incredibly low numbers, and I, I mean, that, that's something I've been thinking about recently as well. I just, uh, it is pretty remarkable how many people are out there that, I mean, there's definitely a vast majority that, that are stuck on a particular style of thought, and then they cultivate everything around that style of thought and then uh, it makes them incredibly inflexible so that they can't back out especially once they start making money i mean once you start making money and you are in this particular camp uh i mean that's that's kind of that's kind of it you're not gonna back out and say oh all of that was wrong and just start over because you're going to lose your your followers you're going to lose your subscribers you're going to lose your uh your source of income which nobody wants to do nobody wants to sacrifice that so it, it is important to to try and be as unbiased as possible to just look at the data and just accept the data for what it is a matter of fact I'm reading a paper right now and I can't I can't even I mean I'm not educated enough on the topic yet but I've been trying to figure out how a particular piece of data fits in with my interpretation of that subject and it's not working so I'm starting to get to the conclusion that my 
interpretation of the subject is incorrect and that I need to change my perspective on it. And that's just going to be part of the growing process, you know. And it's funny as I get torched. I, I really get torched uh, if I if I speak on one subject that's opposite of another subject. So I'll have a video that comes out or a piece of content that comes out that's pro subject A and subject A is opposite of subject B. And then I come out with a piece of content that's pro subject B because believe it or not, people, there is nuance and there is context in the world. And uh, people will just slam me on both pieces of content. You know, obviously, people that support subject A are all about subject A. And then the people are about subject B are all about subject B. So then they cross, right? And they go to each the, the content that's opposite. And they just say a bunch of mean things or just like completely disagree with me on on that subject that they're opposed to. And uh, they ne they never take a step back and just think, huh, Nick is trying to present information. Like, it's clear that he's not sticking to any one point. Like, I'm not trying to stick to, hey, uh, veganism, for example. And this is the particular topics I was thinking of is veganism and his ketogenic diet. So I released content on both relatively recently, and people torched me for both. And then, but nobody ever takes a step back and says, wow, he said some pro things about veganism and he said some pro things about the ketogenic diet, which are not completely opposed, but pretty, pretty far apart from one another. It, it, it's, they never develop this idea of like, you know, maybe this guy is just trying to like look at the data and just present the data as it is. And he doesn't want to push any particular subject like i could easily go full vegan like what you were talking about are these individuals that are uh they st they find a subject and then they're they regardless of the if the information is good or bad they just present it as if it's good for their subject and bad against anything else and that sucks i mean it really sucks but you know that's kind of the sacrifice you have to make. I, I hope that in the long run, and you hope that with other subjects, if that's physics or the rainforest or something along those lines, that you you do find sources of individuals that are that are just uncompromising about finding the truth. They don't care about their own personal bias. They'll change their bias. I mean, in a manner of speaking, they're biased to the truth. They only care about the truth. Right. And that's, that's kind of the goal. Yeah. Find those people. It seems like it's like an extension of the tribalism that you see in human nature in general. People mm -hmm. just like to say, Hey, I'm a, I'm a keto person and <laughs> anybody else is wrong. And I'm in this group with keto people and we all think we're the best. And obviously our diet is better than any other diet. And anyone who says otherwise is wrong and um, we're going to burn their houses down. Yeah, I, it's it's absolutely down that path. But I, I, I can't get over the fact that people aren't self-aware enough to think like, wow, this person released content again that's positive towards my view and i agreed with him fully like 100 percent. just yeah that's totally correct everything you said is awesome and then releases content that's opposite and suddenly i'm wrong about everything like how do people not take a step back and think like huh is that really is that really the case like how can this person be so right about something and then suddenly so wrong about something else? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Oh. They need things to be simple. It's black or white, A or B. Yeah. Grays. 
Oh man, oh man, yeah. It, yeah, it's, which, that that can be that can be really really complicated in its own right. I'm actually editing a video right now. My computer is laboring <laughs> under the the amount of editing that I've put onto this video, but it's looking at the it's an examined piece for the caffeine thing that I did with uh, Alec uh -huh. and uh, the I've I've got so many graphs and I really try and like break it down so it's as simple as I can possibly make it but it's it's a lot of like molecular work and a lot of bioenergetics and metabolism and things of that nature and what's funny is like one very few people are actually going to watch it because it's not really something that once they notice how complicated it is they're going to be like ah screw it <laughs> just <laughs> get just give me the answer and i've gotten a few of those comments like yeah all this science stuff that's great but what's the answer <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you give them that too so yeah no I, I commented i was like yep well the answer is going to be coming in a week you'll get uh, exactly a, a concentrated version of just the answer but uh until that point you're gonna have to sit tight uh yeah but just the the editing process is i can tell that people aren't people are also not going to watch it because it's not a controversial topic it's caffeine and muscle growth so, but if i had put veganism and muscle growth suddenly suddenly things just like go ballistic and everybody's on polar opposites it's just so it's it's weird how for certain things things have to be black and white but for the caffeine thing i'm sure i'll get some comments oh that was very interesting oh <laughs> suddenly because i don't have an emotional attachment to this subject i'm willing to concede that wow molecules really are pretty complex and there's a lot of interaction and there's a lot of context that applies to to this subject but suddenly you rip out the word caffeine and inject veganism or you inject keto and suddenly people are like, you don't get it. You don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> yeah. I just find because it everybody so loves funny. everybody loves caffeine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, exactly. Everybody loves caffeine. Or they just don't have an emotional attachment. If I just put like grass, you know they don't have an emotional attachment to it so they'd be like all right i'll take your word for it right it's, it's such a weird thing about human nature just like you said the tribalism that that appears out of nowhere and people never self-reflect never take a step back and think am i being overly biased yeah <sighs> And it's hard, it's hard for me to put myself in the place of those people because I'm so used to being a scientist and not, you know, trying not to be attached to a particular hypothesis mm -hmm. or, um, you know, potential outcome. Yeah. So I don't really care what, what the data say. I, my job is just to figure out what the data is telling me and present that, you know, I'm not trying to push it one way or another. Can you, can you think of a, a something in physics that, that you think is, uh, is kind of polarizing for people? Like obviously with nutrition and just the human body, you're going to get tons of people, like just hundreds of millions upon billions of people that have opinions but like if you think of like physics are there any like really polarizing aspects i mean people aren't going to exactly debate gravity if that's if that's a real thing or not well there probably are i don't i don't get into the nitty-gritty that much that i would know about those conflicts and yeah. there's always that in science too you've got you know, one scientist come up, comes up with a new theory to explain some bit of um, observed behavior, and um, you know, it's contrary to a hundred years of thought on that subject. And um, he's got a little bit of work to do to convince 
other scientists that he's correct. Yeah. That story about the, um, what was it, ulcers, stomach ulcers, comes to mind. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. It's not physics, but um, I don't know what the the received thinking about stomach ulcers wa- was, but at some point this scientist says, hey, I think so- stomach ulcers are from... I don't, don't know what it was, a microorganism or something like that. And they're not, it's not from an excess of acid or whatever, whatever people were thinking. Uh-huh. And everybody said, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, after a while, um, and s- some more research by the scientist himself and others, uh, people came around to his view too, at least for mm-hmm. certain cases, I'm sure. I mean, I didn't follow it closely, but that's an example of that. The thing is with scientists, though, they're, you know, you don't have any choice but to go with the data, you know. If, if you're out there on your own fighting against everybody else who's presenting data that's contrary to what your um, understanding is, I mean, sure, you can be out there in your lab on your own, but <laughs> nobody's going to listen to you. Yeah. Yeah, you do have to. You do always have to believe your own data over essentially everybody else's. Um, but I mean, even with those individuals that do say that uh, you can't be right. Well, let's just take like the su- stomach ulcers example. It sort of throws me off like I, I sort of understand it if if a person is in that field studying that like especially a scientist i i get that they'd be like well my data is correct or the you know the, the literature is correct whatever but i don't i don't get it when people who just haven't read the studies like literally have not just gone through figure by figure and read the studies themselves or even read like a series of abstracts how people are that convinced they're just what you're crazy that's 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 absolute nonsense i mean how how do you get to that point of confidence without having read anything without having read any studies you just you just believe because everybody else believes it that that's something i i also just don't fully understand well it's a starting point i mean if that's what they're teaching you in your textbook that you learn at school, I mean, you're going to believe that like you believe everything else your teachers tell tell you. Yeah, true. So here's the story. This guy, let's see, I got the really short um, version here. Is it a reliable source? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So this was happened in 1982. So it's pretty recent. I mean, I think it's pretty recent. You might not. Um, But until that point, doctors thought that peptic ulcers were caused by stress and lifestyle. So Mm -hmm. that was it. Everybody was convinced that that was the cause of peptic ulcers. And then this guy comes along and based on his research, he says, no, I think uh, they're, it's caused, caused by this bacterium. Everybody said, you are crazy. And I don't know how long it took for them to come around, but um, <laughs> I see this paper from 2005. 23 years of discovery of this bacterium that causes ulcers. Is the debate over? <laughs> So 23 years later, it's still, there's still some contention. Yeah, that's how it tends to go. But that happens and then people say, well, maybe it isn't black and white. Maybe it's a combination of the two and maybe it's one in certain circumstances and the other in other circumstances. They're generally not like you know, 
you're crazy because you are not a vegan or um, you're crazy if you're not on the ketogenic diet yeah true you get you get a lot of I mean I've, I've seen situations where even scientists get extremely dogmatic about particular stances <laughs> I remember uh, there's uh, something I was trying to figure out actually because I'd been introduced to this idea and this was a, a debate in the exercise physiology literature with lactic acid so it's still a, a point of I don't know people I think I think for the most part people believe that lactic acid contributes to the pain that we experience uh, when we're exercising so let's say you're lifting a weight or whatever or you go running or what like when you first start running you, you feel kind of clunky and you start feeling that, that burning sensation in your musculature well the the uh, textbooks always said that it was due to lactic acid that creates that burning sensation from the hydrogen ions that dissociate from lactic acid and that's what i learned yeah and i will well, defend that thesis to my death well you you, you would you would probably be right oh um, really <laughs> yeah Good. <laughs> yeah but there's this one guy specifically this one researcher called robergs rob robergs i believe his name is and he believes so strongly that it's not lactic acid or lactic acid doesn't contribute to uh, the burning sensation and he he has a bit of a point he released a paper looking at the stoichiometry of uh, of the hydrogen buildup in the body and he mentioned that atp hydrolysis so the the hydrolysis of the molecule adenosine triphosphate to diphosphate you lose that phosphate and uh, throughout that process you use water and you lose a hydrogen or the hydrogen gets released so he thinks that that's the 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 only cause essentially of uh, this burning sensation and then he kept saying well all the evidence that lactic acid leads to this burning sensation is uh, from correlation data correlational data so it's not actually uh, causative and it's just a really strong correlation and then he talks about how nobody has and then he he he's, he had an editorial in in the journal of physiology where he made his argument and uh it was a convincing argument it seemed like it was a convincing army he kept referencing all these studies and whatnot and they were all correlations between you know lactic acid and then he talked about the stoichiometry you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and then in the next issue some researchers <laughs> came in and just annihilated him with just like hey yeah okay that's all well and good but uh you forgot about these like 14 studies <laughs> uh -huh. that show a causative like impact of lactic acid on uh, the burning sensation and just like absolutely torched him so now he he's, he's more he's well I, I guess I don't want to uh, say for sure but um, he's there, there's there's a lot less belief in his thought process not to say that he's completely wrong atp hydrolysis certainly is still a massive contributor maybe even the primary contributor but uh you know it's just it's an example of a researcher who's so dogmatic that he essentially ignored particular pieces of data and just used other pieces of data to make his uh, overall conclusion and then was just steadfast like this is absolutely true to the point where even when he was presented with new data he wouldn't change his 
his perspective and that's that sucks i mean that's not that's not rigorous scientific process in in that situation right well that kind of thing happens but as you said in this case the rest of the scientific community um stepped in and showed him the error of his ways and showed other the error, error of his ways and and that's probably going to be that what would hope hmm. did you uh completely unrelated did you listen to any of the tool album <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess I listened to a couple of the pieces. The first, I listened to the one that you um, sent me. Yeah. Uh, Fear Inoculum. Yeah. Is that the title of the piece? Yeah, that's the intro song. Which is quite good. Have you listened to it? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, about five times so far um, it's it's quite a quite a piece of art that's for sure um, and oh man yeah it's quite something I've been talking about it with uh, Cena and uh, yeah it's 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 really impressive you can tell the evolution of like how how much more skilled they are in their their artistry now compared to like if you listen to their EP or even their like first full album uh, the difference in in quality not just like the mixing and mastering but the, the actual instrumentation is uh, is really really impressive yeah I think so too they really perfected that the kind of music that they create yeah it's so complex that's that's the the crazy thing I just I am always kind of blown away by how can they remember like when they're performing this live how can they per remember all of this work that they put into it like all the di the the difficult uh, drumming and uh, this this album was unique <clears throat> in that the guitarist finally like let loose like usually in all their previous albums uh, the the guitarist has you know put out put down some like really memorable riffs and that you know people recognize for forever but uh, this time he decided he wanted to put some solos into it. And the last, second to last song, Tempest, uh, he, he really like let loose. And apparently <clears throat> he, he'd had some of these like solos and, and riffs, uh, but in his mind for like the last 15 years. <laughs> and he decided to put it into this like one song and it's just crazy. <laughs> the uh the i mean just the complexity of how he like manipulates the guitar it's really really crazy so he he has moments where he really riffs and creates these uh these powerful sounds that are kind of continuous and then he suddenly goes off on another solo and then he like comes back in and and kind of goes back to kind of a, a I don't know something a little more predictable and then goes off on another solo and it's just like it's crazy you you just didn't ex you never heard much of that in previous recordings so it was cool to see him get a song where he really got to express himself uh because like the drummer danny carey has always had like one or i mean all of the songs he's always been absolutely mind-blowing in terms of the complexity of his drumming but uh basically in like most of the other albums he he'd had at least one song where he could just kind of go off and this this album he also had a song called like chocolate or something like that 
something weird and it's it's just him doing a drum solo um which is which is really cool to to listen to but uh the the guitarist never had any opportunities or not very many opportunities to really uh, go off and they finally gave him an opportunity to do it and man he really delivered it was it's it's really an experience after 30 years he had earned the uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he had earned his his. <laughs> okay, we'll give you we'll give you a fifteen minute segment. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll have to listen to the rest of the songs on that album. Yeah, yeah, I listened to it all the way through. The last song is just like in all their other albums their last song is just weird like it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever it's just a bunch of sounds it's not even like music it's just sounds it sounds like my kind of thing uh if, if i'm completely unbiased the last song if you want to call it that is terrible Okay. <laughs> uh, it's called Mockingbird, and it's just a bunch of birds chirping. <laughs> That's it. And it's very harsh; like it just sounds harsh on the ears. So I don't. But they've done that. Like I said, they've done that in other albums as well, where they just end it with like weird sounds like that it just makes no sense it has no place on the album whatsoever i don't i don't get it i don't get it if they just do it to troll everyone or if they have some sort of purpose for for doing it but i've never fully understood why all i can truly say is that they you know the fans have been waiting for 13 years i've only known of them for 10 years so but like the, the fans overall have have been waiting for 13 years for this album <clears throat> and uh, they delivered you know which is a tall task to think that you have you you have this pressure to to come out with an album after 13 years and if it doesn't meet expectations then uh, I mean that that can be pretty detrimental and it does happen a lot when artists have this pressure to, to deliver an album and uh, they haven't done so in such a long time. I mean, fans can become, well, maybe not even necessarily fans, but just even like just casual listeners can be like really hypercritical just because they're, they have this expectations that, uh, that it'll, it'll be a continuation or this like fantastic masterpiece. And uh, sometimes it might still be a good album but people because they've been waiting so long because they've been hungry starving for this album for such a long time they just uh they become overly critical and they don't recognize a good album as good anymore they recognize it as a disappointment so but i i can certainly say from at least my point of view this album was was technically the most complex they've ever done and it was uh it definitely delivered although it it fell short in like one area which i think that they probably purposefully avoided what area was that uh just kind of the in past albums they always had this they always had like one song that was like kind of a power song like the kind of a gritty guitar gritty bass like a, a, a kind of powerful bass line and some kind of some breakdowns with the drums and then Maynard screaming uh, for as long as he possibly can they always had you know one of those songs that really got everybody amped up and uh, they didn't have that in this album well I'll take the the birds never never been a fan of screaming rock musicians <laughs> uh, 
Unlike yeah. Me. Yeah. Unlike me, for sure. Well, you'll have to. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you might. Uh, that Mockingbird song just sucks. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, it's just, it's just bad. It seems like what often happens with uh, musicians is they, or bands, they, they do, you know, several albums in a particular style and they get to be known for that style. And, um, then they get tired of it, you know, or something. They want to do something else, and they come out with something that's like reggae or <laughs> I don't know what, <laughs> but something that's totally different. And their fans are like crying and cursing and fuming, yeah, because all they want to hear is the, you know, what that band is known for. Yeah, I I can t I can totally understand that. I bet. Again, I will say, like, just because they, they moved away from that hard-hitting style, it, it, the album was hard-hitting in different ways. It was just like this, it's just an experience. It's, like, all their albums are experiences, but this one was especially just, like, close your eyes and let it take you for a ride because it's going it, to, it's just so complex and the sounds are so rich. So I, I don't think that they moved away. It's just that they moved more towards that artistic, beautiful side of sound, the complexity and the richness of sound as opposed to, and and really still empowering and, and really powerful music, just a, in just a less direct way. Like they weren't like, okay, here we're going to lay down a ton of bass and just like this gritty guitar, you know, like they would in uh, some of their other albums. So, I mean, and I, I don't think anybody was actually disappointed by by any means. People seem to be going crazy over the album. Yeah, I can't. From what I've heard, I can't imagine people being disappointed. You know. No. I've listened to that Fear Inoculum a couple of times, and it's really a pleasure. It's really something like you say, where you just want to sit and listen in a darkened room with your eyes closed and just kind of wander through the soundscape that's being created for you. Yeah, soundscape is a good good word for it. Tempest and uh, Invincible are definitely up there. I mean, those are... Those are probably my two favorite songs on the album at the moment. Did you ever have any, uh, at any point in your life, can you remember uh, like an, an album or an artist that when you heard their music, you were just like, this is, this is it. Like this is truly top-notch elite unparalleled music <laughs> yeah i had that experience at least once but it wasn't with rock and roll it was a, um, a recording of a mass by haydn one of haydn's mass the masses the um it's called the theresian messe in german mm-hmm the St. Teresa Mass, I don't know what the key is, and it, it was performed by, um, or directed by um, Leonard Bernstein, and um, that was really uh, totally serendipitous. I just went into a record store, this was back in the day when they had record stores and they sold actual vinyl records, the, yeah. You know, before vinyl records went out of fashion and then came back into fashion. Yeah, yeah. And picked this one up for I don't know what reason. It was digitally mastered, which I'm not sure what that meant at that time, but it was quite an improvement in the sound quality um, from what normal recordings were. And I listened to that a lot, and I still absolutely am blown away by that piece of music and that recording of it. Hmm. Do, do you have a version of it still? I still have it on vinyl, yeah. Yeah, but you don't have a vinyl player, do you? I do, yeah. 
Oh, well, we'll have to listen to that sometime then. I'd be curious. It'd probably be, be a better experience on, um, I don't know, where would it be? On Spotify, maybe? or I'm sure it's available. Yeah, okay. Is that vinyl? I don't know why people are so enamored of vinyl, but I was so glad when it was gone. <laughs> and now everybody's crazy about it again. But you listen to a record 50 times and it just isn't the same after that, no matter what you do. Really? Yeah, it just gets crud on it and the crud gets ground into the grooves of the vinyl and yeah. scratches. And, and it's a pain too. It, there's only, what, 30 minutes of music on each side of the disc so you gotta flip it over and then it's picked up all the dust from the mat on your turntable and you gotta clean that off and if you use a liquid cleaning system you can never use anything else so <laughs> so you have to have that equipment available to clean it with before you listen to it man it's crazy the technology, how things have changed. Vinyl, tape players, CDs, and now, well, I mean, even like the MP3, right? That's Even that's become, I wouldn't say necessarily obsolete, but it's, it's not even the same. Like now it's like streaming services through that have even better quality. It's crazy. I find I'm not that fussy, actually. I did some testing years ago already on what frequencies I can hear, just sending the output from a frequency generator into headphones, and um, I don't need anything that produces 20,000 hertz because I can, can't hear beyond, I don't know, 11,000 or 13,000, something like that. Mm -hmm. There's a... I, I, I don't know anything about this, but I, um, I remember reading recently about how apparently there's some audio files believe that even though you can't technically hear particular frequencies above a certain range, they still offer some sort of feeling right. about them, <laughs> which yeah, that, that's not know. new. That's how the guys used to justify buying $50,000 speaker systems to their wives, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you feel better, though? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> sure, I can't. I mean, in principle, I can't hear these frequencies that these super tweeters are producing. <laughs> but, and nobody yeah. actually knows if those frequencies are there, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a theoretical understanding of music. <laughs> that just doesn't seem that important to me. I mean, up to a certain point, of course, you want a good reproduction of the sound, but are you really paying that, that much attention to how how many high frequencies you're hearing and when you're listening to that tool piece oh no all i care about is does it sound good which yeah. uh, does it not sound bad i mean and then you get into the music and who cares you know well i mean admittedly i will say like there's like there's good sounding music there's like okay sounding music there's good sounding music and then there's like phenomenal sounding music and you even mentioned this like you you heard the fear inoculum and that was like mastered and edited uh and mixed to a point where it sounded just unbelievable like the different layers you could you could pay attention to a layer of sound and just follow that layer of sound and right that really is quite amazing. phenomenal quality but and you don't 
get that as it doesn't come across like there's a clear distinction between when i'm listening to it on my bluetooth headphones which i paid twenty dollars for or if i'm listening to it using like the mdr headphones like there's a massive difference between those two but like beyond the mdrs i i can't imagine that there's that much of an increase and is it really worth paying however many hundreds or thousands of dollars that you end up paying for for slightly better even if if it is slightly better sometimes i feel like people just trick themselves into believing that there's a a, a noticeable difference yeah i think there's a lot of that in the audiophile world if you don't tell a person how much it costs they probably can't tell a difference yeah I looked up uh, reviews of like different microphones just because I was interested and uh, Kyle was looking for a microphone so I, I was looking into a few for him and uh, like there's a comparison of like a $15 microphone a $100 microphone and uh, like a $300 microphone and surprisingly enough you could actually tell the di like there were actual significant step changes between the 15 to the 100 from the 100 to the 300 but then i looked up a, a video by the same person that compared the 300 to like a five thousand dollar microphone and at the end of the video he was like i i can't tell the difference like there's there's absolutely zero difference um, right so which is yeah but people still make them people still buy them and then take those results from those three different uh, price levels of microphones and mix them up and present them to the average listener and ask them which one you know works better or which one sounds better to you right i mean you can tell a difference maybe but is it is it like better yeah right yeah because some of them sound warmer or some of them sound right uh clear or you know whatever it is it's just a it's probably just a frequency response thing you know one of them responds better at lower frequencies and um but do, is that better you know does that sound better yeah of course the audiophile is going to say well whatever reproduces the original sound the best is the best even if it costs five thousand dollars but um if i'm sitting in my living room listening on my speakers to fear inoculum it's good I mean, it's good enough yeah. i don't want to put my headphones on i know the headphones are going to reproduce more accurately but um it's not going to increase my enjoyment of that piece of music because there's so much more to it than just the audio reproduction right Yeah, people getting tied up into the weeds. Yeah, especially guys like their technical stuff, you know. You see yeah. a, a bicyclist, for example. He's going to he'll pay $1,000 to shave an ounce off of his bike. And he could <laughs> just, like, get a haircut or take a leak before he goes for a ride and you know, he'll lose 10 times as much weight. Right. You named this Coffee with Nick 3. Is this our third episode? Pretty fancy, huh? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah, I guess I guess it is. I kind of feel bad we don't have any video, though. Well, once we get the audio mastered, we can... Maybe do a kind of a split screen video or something like that. Yeah. Go to the next level of difficulty. Yeah. Well, I think I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go eat. I haven't eaten yet today, and starting to to lose a lot of energy. 
I still need to finish the other half of my video editing, which is going to take me, I, I don't know how long it's going to take me, a long time. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure. Likewise, it has been a pleasure. <laughs> Just uh, can't wait for that next text message with... <laughs> <laughs> the Zencaster link. <laughs> oh, it's going to be great. <laughs> Next time we're together, I'll teach you to, to enter an address in your address bar by hand. <laughs> That's like not the, the point. Like in the olden days of oh, computers man. when you had to type instead of clicking on links. Uh, I spilled honey all over my uh, my keyboard. That was rather unfortunate. So some of the the keys are now really sticky, and <laughs> over time, I'm trying to unstick it, unstick them. Try putting it in the dishwasher. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll get I'll get right on that. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I guess I'll talk to you next time. Okay, sounds good. So send me a MP3, I guess, and I'll see if I can stick this together. Yeah, I can do that. Or, sounds good. Or do I? I guess I can get your MP3 from Zencaster, I suppose, right? Yeah, you'll be able to. You'll be able to get my my. So MP3 I'll try that. If it sounds decent, I'll use that. Okay. Well, let me know because I've I've been recording obviously uh, locally as well. Okay, have a good evening. Thanks, you too, likewise. See ya. Bye.